The Kingdom of Malts, a tale by Erwin Schiff, about inflation and where it comes from. Puzzled by inflation? This book proves that any 10-year-old can explain where inflation comes from and why. Thanks, Vivian Kellums, for the inspiration. Introduction. To write of inflation is to write of people's infinite capacity to be tricked by politicians. Read The Kingdom of Malts for a good laugh and then a good cry. In the sleepy Balkan kingdom of Malts, people pay taxes according to the height of their houses. Those living in houses under 15 feet paid no tax, but a tax of five gold pieces was levied on every foot over that. In addition, a surtax of 10% was added on houses over 20 feet, 20% on houses over 25 feet, and 30% on houses over 30 feet, with a maximum surtax of 40% on houses over 35 feet. You can see immediately that the people of Maltz were truly progressive in the matter of taxation. The poor people in Maltz, those obviously living in the smallest houses, escaped taxation completely, while those living in the biggest houses, obviously the more affluent, paid progressively higher taxes. This surtax, of course, added a truly sophisticated feature to the system. While this method of taxation was exceedingly fair and progressive, it did nonetheless exert an influence on the lifestyle as well as the housing styles that existed in Maltz, as taxes often do. Many houses in Maltz were constructed exactly 14 feet 11 inches high, while most others were built exactly 19 feet 11 inches, 24 feet 11 inches, 29 feet 11 inches, etc., etc. It must also be observed that people in Maltz generally built houses somewhat smaller than they would have preferred. For these reasons, the citizens of Maltz lived a bit more cramped than necessary, but that's kingdom biz. One day, as fate would have it, the king of Maltz, Igor II, was informed by the royal treasurer that the royal bank account was practically depleted. A conference of the king's advisors was hurriedly called to determine why there was such a royal money shortage. Going over the royal books, it became evident that King Igor was spending too much money in relation to tax revenues. Igor, therefore, would have to do one of two things. He would either have to cut his spending on the royal court and on his royal fooling around, or he would have to raise taxes. Of course, cutting down on wasteful and unnecessary royal spending was unthinkable. So Igor did what all kings and politicians do in situations like this, and that is to call for more taxes. Igor explained to his ministers there was no alternative but to raise taxes. Henceforth, taxes would be six gold pieces a foot instead of five, the housing exemption would be lowered to 13 feet, and all surtax brackets lowered accordingly. There was some general agreement on these proposals, but then Princhik, the minister of the interior, spoke up. Your kingship, he said. I think that it would be a terrible mistake to raise taxes now. There is discontentment among the, your subjects, possibly due to their cramped state of mind. A tax increase at this time would, I suggest, release considerable resentment and could set off a rebellion. Several ministers expressed agreement with Princhik's assessment. Perplexed and frustrated, Igor looked at his ministers and asked, But how can we raise revenue without raising taxes? Silence fell as each minister pondered this difficult question. Suddenly, Kurtzoff, the little minister of taxation, jumped onto the long oaken table and, and began to shout, I got it! I got it! You've got what? How we can extract more taxes without increasing taxes? Well, let's hear it, said Igor, displaying some annoyance at Kurtzoff's unministerly behavior. It's really simple, said Kurtzoff. Since by tradition, your majesty makes all the yardsticks and rulers used in the kingdom, we need only call on all existing yardsticks and rulers and issue new ones. Build 10 inches to the foot instead of 12. By making a foot 2 inches shorter, all rulers and yards will be shortened by 16%, which will accomplish the following. 1. All buildings will immediately be 16% higher and thus subject to more taxes. 2. Many buildings will now fall into the higher surtax brackets, thereby increasing taxes substantially more than 16%. And 3. All buildings built 14 feet 11 inches high to escape taxation will now measure over 15 feet and be subject to tax. By this means, continued Kurtzoff, who had since crawled down from the table, royal revenue will be doubled and we wouldn't have raised taxes one lick. You can't be serious, said Orloff, minister of royal celebration. One would only have to compare an old ruler with the new one to see that we change the unit of measurement. The idea is preposterous. No, it isn't, explained Kurtzoff. First of all, when we call on all the old rulers, we'll do it in the name of some national emergency. We'll declare that after that date, anyone caught with an old ruler in his possession will be regarded as an enemy of the state and subject to severe punishment, perhaps banishment to the salt mines of Criberia. No one will dare own up to having an old ruler then. But, observed Clunker, Minister of Palace Decorations, if we measure their houses with a smaller ruler, they will surely recognize that their houses haven't grown any taller. Thus, 
they must see through this whole scheme. But they won't, again insisted, insisted Kurtzoff. People have short memories. They will have forgotten how high their houses are. Besides, before we measure a citizen's house, we will measure the citizen. He will be pleased to discover that he is taller than he remembered being, and this will put him in a happier, more receptive frame of mind. Why, our new rulers will eliminate all short men from malts. The people will begin to even feel better about living in bigger houses, and psychologically may even feel less cramped. Besides, the measurement will be there for all to see. Since your subjects, your royal kingship, will assume you to be an honest and honorable man, it would simply not occur to them that you could be guilty of such a despicable and dishonest act as to shorten the nation's traditional unit of measurement, and thus betray the trust and confidence that the people have placed in you. Believe me, your highness, it will work. I think the idea is insane, chimed in Obanon, Minister of Rural Traveling. It will be impossible to pull so much wool over the eyes of so many people. Gorky, the Minister of Justice, who had been listening quite intensively, interrupted at this point. Maybe it can work at that. I have been reading about a country called America where they calculate wealth and pay taxes in dollars. In dollars, acquired Igor. What are dollars? Dollars, your highness, explained Gorky, are what they use for money. You mean they don't use gold or silver? No, your highness. What are dollars made of? Paper, your kingship. Paper, replied the king incredulously. You mean they prefer, prefer paper to gold and silver? I couldn't say for sure, your highness. I do know that at one time they did use gold and silver, but now they only use a paper and a little bit of copper. Well, what happened to all their gold and silver? questioned Igor. Their government took it all, replied Gorky. But how can they transact business and pay taxes without gold and silver? Well, replied Gorky, the government gave them these paper dollars for the gold and silver, and then told them to transact their business and pay their taxes with these paper dollars. But, said the king, obviously impressed with another monarch's ability to acquire all of his subjects' gold and silver simply for bits of paper, that must have required a great deal of force. I mean, was there much fighting and resistance? How many soldiers had to be dispatched to people's houses to force them to accept paper for their gold and silver? No, your kingship, you don't understand Americans, explained Gorky. Americans are really quite docile, and will do anything their government tells them. So when the government told them to accept paper for their gold and silver, they simply did it. Americans regard obedience to government edicts as a sign of patriotism. There's nothing their government cannot get them to do so long as it comes in an official envelope. For instance, while we dispatch our tax collectors throughout the kingdom to figure and collect our taxes, Americans figure their own taxes and pay them right to the government. Why, the government even has them collecting taxes from each other, often at great expense to themselves. Incredible, said Igor. But tell me more about these paper dollars. How many pounds of these paper dollars would it take to buy a horse, for instance? Well, it doesn't work like that, your kingship, replied Gorky. They don't weigh their paper as we weigh our gold. When they make their paper dollars, they put numbers on them. And the bigger the number it has, the more value it has. So you could conceivably buy a horse in America with only one piece of paper, providing you had a big enough number on it. Igor, still a bit confused, Question further. What precisely is the difference between five dollars and fifty dollars? Well, your highness, answered Gorky, a fifty dollar piece of paper has an extra O following the five, which the five dollar piece of paper does not have. And that little O makes it worth ten times as much? That is correct, your majesty. Both pieces of paper weigh the same? Yes, your highness. Both pieces of paper measure the same? Yes, your highness. That being the case, I still don't see why one should be more valuable than the other. Well, said Gorky, in America, people will simply exchange more goods for pieces of paper having bigger numbers on them than they will for pieces of paper having smaller numbers. That is why larger numbered pieces of paper are more valuable than smaller numbered pieces of paper. Where do all these pieces of paper, these dollars, come from? asked Igor. Well, in America, the government is responsible for making dollars, much in the same way, sire, as in malts. You make the rulers. This is why, continued Gorky, I was thinking that Kurtzoff's suggestion might work. Because in America, the government is always making dollars smaller by making more and more of them to use to pay some of its own bills. Naturally, each new dollar made buys less, and so, it's indeed, so it is indeed smaller. So why can't we in malts make rulers smaller? Why, in America, when they make their dollars smaller, they even herald the event by official proclamation. Then the government tells the people to calculate their wealth in these smaller dollars. And they do it? Naturally. Their wealth now appears to be larger, so they pay more taxes, and the government doesn't have to raise taxes. Also, in this manner, the populace can be fooled into believing that they are growing richer, 
even as they are being made poor. Amazing, said King Igor, scratching his head in utter disbelief. And the government can really get away with that? It doesn't seem to present a problem, your kingship, replied Gorky. But, observed Igor, the king of America must be a really powerful fellow to get away with a stunt like that. They don't have a king, your kingship. They govern themselves. You mean they play this trick on themselves? Yes, your kingship. Then, laughed King Igor, America must truly be a land of simpletons. No, your highness, Americans are not simpletons, said Gorky. As a matter of fact, Americans spend a lot of time and money on education. Why, in America, education amounts to a national fetish. Schooling is compulsory until age 16, the most continue to age 18, with many continuing to ages 22 and 30. I think that it is quite possible that, in America, more time is spent on study than in work. Well, said Igor now feeling somewhat encouraged and relieved if they can get away with that in america since in Maltz we have no schools at all maybe we can get away with it too